through a doll's eyes. Written by Joffin and narrated by Lady Spukaria. Sounds. Light. What is this? How long have I been awake? The lounge room is so familiar, but I can't recall when I first laid eyes on it. I try to remember the days before my consciousness, but I find it simply impossible. If there is a greater being who controls the movement of time, he's surely forgotten little old me in this empty house. The lounge room is neither light nor dark. I do not know how long it remains in either state. I simply sit here and stare at the wall. Any idea of the year or hour is more than my brain can think of. If I have one. I may not see what's inside me, but I know what I look like on the outside because of a mirror opposite the couch I sit on. My features are rounded, like a plump tomato, with skin so shiny that the sun blocks my face in the mirror at certain times of the day. My eyes are blue, full of extravagant detail. I know the lids around them will shut if I lay down, so I admire them for as long as I can, until the day may come when someone may knock me over and I'll be trapped in darkness. Never to see my wonderful eyes again. My bonnet is a dark purple, with a lovely stitched dress of the same colour scheme. A pretty little bow is tied under my chin. Whoever made me must be a truly gifted person. They created a perfect doll, full of charm and modesty. I am truly pretty. Pretty. What is so familiar about that word? I know it well. I've referred to myself with it many times. But it reminds me of something else. A word? Yes. But more than a word. A name. Smitty. The Smitties. The owners of this home. My family. How could I have forgotten... They were here, living and breathing, cooking and dancing, talking and laughing. There was Mama Smitty, Papa Smitty, I mean, my brother Ezekiel, and my best friend in the whole world, Prudence. She was here. I know it, they all were. I know I had a past with them, and I know they all loved me. Very much. Except for Ezekiel. Why does he hate me? Why can't I remember the details? Prudence meant the world to me. But I can't seem to fully remember her. There's flashes of memory. Glimpses into the past. But that's all I can conjure up in my mind. I will sit on this couch and think about it some more. I want more than anything to remember my friend, but I understand it will take time. I don't mind. Time is all I have. I will remember my friend, no matter how long it takes. When my memories of prudence finally come to me, the lounge room had been overrun with intruding plants. I watched as they slowly crept through the cracks in the floors and took the room by force. Above the mirror is a shelf which sits a stack of books and a statue of a man I do not know. These were now surrounded by vines, threatened to be closed off from my sight. It makes me sad to see these things go. But I could live without them. It's not as if I could read and I truly didn't care who the man was. All that matters now is pretty little me and my mirror. I recently remembered my friend Prudence. She looked like me. Plump features and dark hair. 
I remember her smile would warm my heart and the heart of her family. When I was given to Prudence, she was only a little child. She couldn't speak, but I knew what she was thinking. I knew she loved me. We grew up together as best friends, as sisters. She talked to me all the time, sharing everything she knew and felt. When she cried, I cried with her. When she laughed, I howled. I felt everything she could. Joy, sadness, fear, anger, all the emotions. I wanted so desperately to display them before her. But all I could do was stare with the same expression I've had my whole life. Did she know how much I cared about her? She couldn't have. I was only a doll. Is that why she left me? No, don't say that. Prudence would never let me go. When the Smitties packed up to leave once, Prudence cried that she couldn't take me. They returned not long after, and the first thing she did was rush into her room and embrace me in her arms. Aside from that, she took me everywhere. I liked it when she took me outside and placed me in the basket of her bicycle. We'd ride down the road, wind racing through our hair, making my bonnet flail around. We'd arrive in the town and she'd park her bike against a building and take me into the square. We would meet her other friends who brought their dolls and we'd play hopscotch on the road. Sometimes the nearby bakers would give us pastries for no reason other than we made them smile. I loved her friends almost as much as I loved Prudence. There was Mary, Clarence, Bernadette, and Veronica. And their lovely dolls were named Joan, Little Clarence, Betsy, and Ethel. I do not know if they're alive like I am now. If they are, are they too missing their girls? I think about the dolls and the friends from time to time but I mainly focus on Prudence. Prudence's brother Ezekiel also had friends. I do not know their names, but they were as wicked as him. One time when Prudence was in the dining room and I lay on her bed, Ezekiel and his friends snuck into her room and quietly snatched me away. I was terrified. I wanted to cry out and call for Prudence to come and rescue me, but alas, I'm only a doll. They took me upstairs, into Ezekiel's room. They tied a rope to my leg and dropped me out the window. I would have surely broke into pieces if I hit the ground, but I was suspended. Ezekiel held the other end of the rope, keeping me from touching the ground. He began pulling me towards the window. Hey, Prudence, Ezekiel shouted. Your dolls learned to fly. I saw Prudence rush out of the house. She screamed when she saw me. Give her back! She shouted as she tried to grab me. Ezekiel and his friends laughed as he tugged me up and down, just out of Prudence's reach. Prudence rushed inside and I heard her call for Mama. The boys quickly pulled me back into the house and untied the rope. Next thing I knew I was back in Prudence's room and they were nowhere to be seen. I heard their voices somewhere in the houses and I heard my sweet Prudence crying. Mama Smitty comforted her and scolded Ezekiel and his friends. I had almost died that day. It was terrifying. In that moment I made a promise I would never leave Prudence. We would grow together and she would protect me and I would make her smile every day. But now I find myself alone, without my best friend, and the fear I felt that day comes back. More time has passed since I finally remembered Prudence. I don't know how long it's been, but the books and the man's head on the shelf are now trapped in an unrecognizable tangle of green. The plant life has begun creeping up the couch, threatening to engulf me. I hear a new sound. Something other than the usual wind and chirping of birds. 
It's a familiar sound I have not heard in a long time. Footsteps. Could it be Prudence? Did she escape whoever took her away and come back for me? My mind races with excitement as the footsteps grow louder. Prudence, it's me. I've waited for you for so long. Now we can be together again. It's not Prudence. It's a young man I've never seen before. He carries some sort of pack on his back, containing contents I'm not sure of. He sets the pack on the ground and kneels down and opens it. He glances around the room, freezing when he sees me. I hear him say a series of dreadful words only Mama and Papa Smitty have said. He gets up and walks towards me. He towers over me and I'm afraid. He crouches down and now we look at each other face to face. He makes a face I can only read as negative. How could he look at me that way? Did he not see how beautiful I was with my rosy rounded cheeks and my beautiful curled hair? I was upset when he walked into the room and wasn't prudent. But now I'm annoyed at his unpleasant mannerisms. He walks back to his pack and draws some sort of canister out of it. He shakes it a couple of times and brings it to a wall. I am completely horrified as he begins spraying purple mist out of the canister and onto the wall. What was he doing? He's ruining the Smitty's home. I try to scream, shout, do anything to get his attention, but it's hopeless. He draws more canisters from his pack and starts spraying coloured designs on the walls of the house. The beautiful scenery I've looked at for so long is now gone, replaced by colourful vulgarity. I'm more than upset now. I'm angry. I'm furious. And just when I think it couldn't get any worse, he does the unthinkable. My mirror, my beautiful mirror I've gazed into for what must have been years, was destroyed in an instant, covered in orange spray. I could not see my pretty dark purple bonnet anymore, nor my detailed eyes. All I've hung on to for so long is now gone. Inside, I'm crying tears of hate, but on the outside, I stare as if nothing had happened. He walks up to me once again and lifts me up. I have to do something. I must do something. I see Ezekiel once more grinning at me with that evil smile as he and his friends torture me and make my sweet prudence cry. His smile drops and he stares at me, first in confusion, then in fear. He drops me back onto the couch and I fall over, my eyes shut and I am in darkness. Oh no, not this. Please don't leave me like this. I hear him run out of the room with quick panicked breaths. I'm alone again, but this time with nothing to look at. Prudence, help me. My eyelids won't move. I'm trapped in darkness. My mirror is gone and the pretty little room is ruined. I moved by myself just a second ago, but I can't muster the ability again. This is it. This is what I spent my years on end dreading. Not even the light of the sky nor my house can keep me company. I'm swallowed by the dark. For an eternity, I lay there in complete darkness. Ever since that day my eyes shut, I've been trying to move again. I do not know how I was able to touch his nose that day. It just happened. If I move once, I can move again. I've told myself to move over and over again. I've tried to force my limbs to do something. Anything. And then it happened. First it was a jolt from my hands. A slight little movement. Then what must have been years later, it was a much larger swing of my arms. I now push myself up from my laying position. Working both arms and legs. I stumble back onto my side. But it doesn't matter how many times I've failed. I spent too long making myself move to give up now. I try and try again, 
falling back each time, trying new methods, finally figuring out the right motion. I'm overcome with joy as my eyes slide open. I had forgotten what the morning light had looked like. So beautiful. I'm now sitting upwards on the couch. I stare across the room at the mirror. The orange spray has settled. My poor mirror is truly gone. I find that I can turn my head as well. I'm now truly in control of myself. I'm more than a doll. Perhaps I am now a human? I glance down at my pretty dress, only to find a horrid bug crawling on me, eating away at my clothes. I felt some anger I felt the first time I moved. How dare that intruder, or bug, or anyone come into the smitty's home and ruin it. In a sudden movement, I raise my hand and bring it down on the bug. It was a slow swing, but my unmoving fingers moved on top of the insect before it could move away. I push my hand down, slowly killing it. After an eternity of misfortune, I finally found satisfaction. The bug was ruining my dress. It deserved to die. I bring my hand away and the bug's flattened corpse is stuck to my palm. I get off the couch, falling face first on the ground. My eyes shut once more. I remember how I got up from the couch and used the same tactic to get on my feet. I stand for the first time in my life. Not with prudence holding me up or propping me against the wall. This was a real stand. Just my feet on the floor and nothing else. I take a step, stumble and fall. I get back up and try again. The sun rose and fell many times before I began to walk normally. When I could take a step without tripping, I decided it was time to find prudence myself. I'm stuck with nostalgia as I wander through the smitty's house. Everything was just as I remembered it, but less alive. I could barely see what was ahead of me as I walked through the dark hallway that used to glow with electric bulbs. I turn to the left and walk into the lavatory to begin my search. I can't remember exactly when the Smitties disappeared. They were with me and then they were gone. There must be something here that can tell me where they went. The lavatory is untouched, aside from the cobwebs surrounding the corners of the ceiling. I look up at the counter, noticing a mirror peeking up from the edge. I have to get up there. If there's no clues to be found on top of the counter, I will at least get to see my pretty face again. I crawl up onto the toilet seat, just barely holding on as I squirm to get on top. I manage to stand up on the seat, then climb onto the tank lid. From there I move with ease onto the counter, tumbling into the sink. I take a moment to look at my surroundings. The countertop was barren, just as I had thought. I stand up and look at myself in the mirror for the first time in forever. I gasp when I see myself. My face, my poor face was forming small cracks over my cheeks. I held them in my hands, ashamed to even look at them. When I find prudence, I know she'll find a way to fix it. She always made things better. The next few rooms brought back plenty of old memories, but none of them were able to give me a clue as to the whereabouts of Prudence and her family. The last of the rooms was Prudence's. I felt a lingering sense of happiness as I stepped inside. It was old and abandoned like the rest of the house, but I loved it just as much as I always had. Everything seemed untouched since I last saw it. The tea set she and I played with still sat on her little table near the bed. I crawl up onto her chair to get a closer look. When I get to the top, I see her. Prudence. A photograph of my best friend sits on the table, staring me in the face. She had the same rosy smile I knew and loved. 
and in her arms was me. I feel a wave of sadness and jealousy wash over me as I look at my old self. I was shiny and new, with an uncracked face and unwrinkled clothing with no holes. When I find Prudence, she'll give me a new dress and seal off the cracks of my skin and coat it with new, shiny paint. I leave the room, finding nothing of significance to the family's whereabouts. I had searched every room on the first floor. All I had left were the ones upstairs. I travel up the staircase, carefully crawling onto each step. If I slide and tumble down the stairs, my head would surely crack open. I don't know what would happen to me then, but I'm sure it would prevent me from ever seeing Prudence. I reach the top of the stairs and look down the hallway. There are only four rooms up here, but one of them caught my attention. Unlike the rest of the rooms, the one on the far end of the hall was closed. I remembered the room as Mama and Papa Smitty's bedroom. I wandered towards it, wondering if I had been able to reach the handle. I can't. I'm simply too short. I look in the other rooms for something I could stand on. I come across a step stool on the second floor bathroom. I awkwardly get my stubby hands around it and drag it out of the bathroom, into the hallway, and against the far door. I step up on it, and just barely reach the doorknob. With some struggling, I'm able to turn it. I push on the door and it opens. The carpet was a different colour from what I last remembered. It was faded brown, almost red. The same colour seemed to be soaked into the bed sheets. Something must be on Smitty's bed. I have to know what. I approach the bed and try to get a hold of the sheet. It's impossible. My fingers barely move and it's simply too tall to pull myself up on. I turn around to grab my stool when I freeze. Behind the open swung door was Papa Smitty. His clothes were dyed the same colour as the bed and rug. As I approach him, I notice he's not the same Papa Smitty I knew. His skin was greyish and tight and he was unmoving. I touch his arm, but he has no reaction. I can't understand it, but I knew something was wrong. I began fearing for the worst as I hurried to my steps door. I bring it to the foot of the bed and climb on top. I stare on top of the bed. Three familiar faces lay there. Their faces are almost unrecognisable, but I recognise their clothing. Sprawled out on the bed was Mama Smitty, mean brother Ezekiel, and Prudence. My sweet Prudence. I crawl across the bed to her. They were all like Papa Smitty, grey and still, but the first time in my life, I understood what it felt like to be a human looking at a doll. Prudence's once beautiful blue eyes were now faded and colourless. I reach over and close her eyelids. My poor Prudence must have lost herself without me, but I will fix her. I lay down next to her, curling up in her arm. We won't be separated again, my sweet Prudence. We'll be together for the rest of eternity. I hope you enjoy this story. This amazing story was written by Joffin. Please check out his links in the description below. This video was made with the support of my incredible Patreons and channel members. Check out the links if you'd like to sign up. I also have some amazing merch with some new stuff on the way. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe if you haven't already. And don't forget to stab that little bell button too. Stay safe, my little spookling. And remember, I'll be watching you.